the permeate is a solution that permeates through the membrane. So whatever makes it through the OSN membrane is the permeate. The retentate are the particles that accumulate, don't make it through the membrane. There are two main types of filtration processes, be it um, dead-end or cross-flow filtration. Dead-end is filter paper, where the particles are retained on the surface of the filter medium. Cross-flow or tangential filtration. The main difference is that there is no accumulation of particles. You have one inlet and two outlets versus like in a dead-end filtration, you typically have an inlet and an outlet. So because there's no accumulation of particles, it is a self-cleaning filter. And the way it self-cleans is that whenever a particle perhaps lodges into the nanoparticles of the membrane, the pressure of the water rushing through the, or the solvent rushing through the membrane dislodges that particle and cleans the membrane. So it it's, has a much lower operating cost because you're not replacing the consumables periodically or as often as you would with um, dead infiltration. What's an infiltration? So there's different types of filtration sizes that you can do with membrane filtration. And so smallest pore size is generally with reverse osmosis as to where you can filter salts out of water. And we're one step above that, which is an infiltration, and we can get down to ionic sizes to uh, separate solvents and stuff like that. So then if you look at the screen, this is a, the delta weight of molecules that you can filter out. So generally when there is a there's enough separation between mo uh, molecule sizes, you can separate them. So for example, our cannabinoids are in the 300 Dalton range, so you can separate ethanol or methanol or those types of solvents from your cannabinoids. What you can't do is separate CBG from THC because they're almost, this is a way to separate particles by size. They could filter paper or something like that. The cool thing about the process is that it eliminates so much equipment and so many steps in the traditional process from starting material all the way down to isolate. So that drastically reduces your capital expenditure of setting up a lab and the operating expense because there's less consumables, less energy, and less equipment put together, less, and less labor. So it really just changes the dynamics of a, what a laboratory looks like and what it costs to make one and what it costs to operate one. Some of the benefits is that you can do solvent recovery at room temperature. Because we're not going to vapor phase, we're just filtering by size. And at these sizes, you're able to remove water and all of these solvents straight up by simple filtration. Um, it is a non-thermal process. Therefore, you are not going to decarboxylate. You're not going to damage any of the terpenes and so on and so forth because it's done at room temperature pretty much. And of course, we would have discussed because there is less energy involved, it has a lower operating expense because it's a cross flow filter. There's, a, there's a less operating expenses. And of course, because there is less equipment involved, the capital expenditure of setting up a lab is less. And the main benefit is the electrical consumption, which is a small fraction of traditional winterization or solvent recovery methods. And when we look at cost, this is a very clear competitive, comparative analysis of just the amount of energy that's required to do your traditional uh, vapor phase uh, solvent recovery whether it be a still, rising film, falling film, rotary evaporator, it is a magnitude of um, kilowatt hours versus dead infiltration, which is like filter paper or nano filtration. Desalination is a little bit more energy intensive because it uses higher pressures, but nonetheless, the most expensive by far to operate is when you're going into a vapor phase. What are the applications for membranes? You can do solvent recovery of pretty much any solvent from pentane down to water. You can do winterization, you can do uh, terpene isolation, you can actually remove terpenes and cannabinoids from water if you're doing like a solvent, solventless based extraction, if you're doing like ice water or a cold water extraction. There's color remediation where you can remove carotenoids and pigments and such. You can do, uh, there's lots of applications for cartel and kava, psilocybin, and there's applications with pentane, hexane, and heptane where you can remove sugars and things like that. You can really nitpick the particles that you want to target with this technology. Typical SOP with solvent recovery, let's say I have a, cent a centrifuge uh, or a screw press based solvent extraction, we're going to take that extract and either filter it warm or room temperature. The colder you filter it at, the slower it is. So we're typically, if we're doing a cryo extraction, we'll wait for that solvent to reach room temperature before we begin filtering. 
And then we filter that, and it's a simple filtration. There is no heat applied to it or anything like that. And when you do it in this method, the membranes will generally, of the smallest commercial sized membranes, will deliver something in the tune of 60 gallons per hour. And you can scale exponentially. You can easily do 800 gallons per hour. And obviously, the, the larger you scale, the more cost efficient the process is. Then, winterization, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad term for what the process can do, but you can filter the general molecules that you filter out during the winterization process. This picture is uh, Baker Static Crude, and you can see the before and after of that uh, crude being winterized. And the process removes not just the traditional waxes and fats, but lipids, phospholipids, phosphatides, gums, chlorophylls, carotenoids, water-soluble compounds, uh, sugars, uh, anything with a polymeric material with a charge, things of like that. So it's much more than just lipids, fats, and waxes. You can remove terpenes from ice water extracts, like I mentioned. So you, you remove the excess solvent and you create a hydrosol. And that hydrosol can then be remediated to select the terpenes that are in that water or the cannabinoids that may have leached into that water because of the extraction process, some pop heads. And so it makes it economically viable to recover those potential losses. And more importantly, the terpenes have such a high commercial value that tend to strip out during the uh, ice water, cold water process. In Kratom, uh, Kava as well, there's significant interest in that because you can remove a lot of the, the taste out of the Kratom extracts while still producing a full spectrum extract. And it, in the right SOP, you can use uh, whether water or a solvent base, but generally you're able to produce a full spectrum crude with the potency of 75% or, or something like that. Um, mushroom extraction in general, again, the, the, the process there, you can do solvent recovery or a winterization and the winterization will remove so much more than just fats. And in solvent recovery, you know, it, whether it be a uh, water-based um, uh, mushroom extract uh, or a solvent-based, nonetheless, it removes all of that solvent so your downstream processes can be more efficient. So what are some of the hiccups that we've had in the past with the technology? You know, initially, when the membranes were new, they were extremely expensive. But just because of the manufacturing was new, there wasn't the volume for it, the technology was new. So the cartridges themselves were extremely expensive. Now they really have, they're a fraction of the price today. And you had some white label companies that simply would take a, an expensive membrane and just white label it and charge a cannabis premium to it, unfortunately. Then there was poor membrane selection. There wasn't just a lot of, there was not a lot of research on how the membranes performed over time. And so it's been a learning curve to find membranes that hold up over time and that are effective. And so throughout the years, the amount of solvent that you can filter has grown, has just increased. There was some fouling problems with the membranes. The expensive membranes would foul in, in a matter of weeks sometimes, and that increased the operating costs and just, it was not feasible because of the cost and the short membrane life. Some of the machines had extremely high capex machines that really had very small throughput with, uh, you know, purchase prices of upwards of a million dollars. So again, the ROI was hard to come by. There was poor support. Just the companies that were selling the products didn't understand. They were not, they didn't have a lot of expertise in the field. Um, the design was poor, so they didn't perform as good as they could have because a lot of the manufacturers were not membrane companies. So they just saw the potential and stood by it, but unfortunately just didn't have the experience to really fully scale the, the technology as it should have been. There were poor SOPs. They didn't understand how these things needed to be cleaned, how they needed to be maintained, you know, how they could run, how long they could run for, and so on and so forth. And then generally overselling to the customer what the technology could and couldn't do. So the expectations were just um, unrealistic. What are the, some, uh, some of the opportunities in membrane filtration? So like I said, Kava and Kratom and, and, and those botanicals in general, there's a lot of potential there to winterize and, and just make a cleaner product, cheaper, faster, of higher quality. Just mycology in general, not just psilocybin-based uh, mushrooms, but mycology in general, there's a lot of uh, interest in, in, in all kinds of beverages that are derived from 
the mycology industry that can greatly improve from the technology. Uh, we've been involved in projects where we're taking protein from algae that is being used for protein drinks. There's all types of new extracts every day, new types of applications where this can go into. And very soon there's a ton of um, very smart people that are doing research on how to deploy membranes with BHO. So you could have a BHO system that has membranes incorporated in line instead of using powders for CRC and whatnot. That's all I have for you guys today. If you guys have any questions, please let me know.